good morning. It's good to be with you. We are continuing a series this morning that we call Poverty Gospel. Um, and it's kind of a weird place to start. You just leave that slide up there. You're going to leave it up there. Um, one, of the, one of the features of not having Wi-Fi this morning was that I don't have any illustrations for the thing. So just you can set that and leave it and it should be good. Oh, it's going to try to rotate. That's what it's doing. So we're not going to worry about it. Just leave it off. <clears throat> I'm troubleshooting as we go here. Um, yeah, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a weird image, and it's kind of a, a little bit of a backwards thing to what a lot of people are talking about today. There's, there's a common phrase um, that people will refer to called the prosperity gospel. And it's this idea that if I choose to follow God, then God's going to fix all of my problems and give me everything that I want, plus a little bit more. Because if I follow God and I'm a good boy or a good girl, then he must want to make sure that I'm happy all the time. And we all know how that goes with children. And God doesn't work with us any less graciously than we'd work with our own children. So this idea of poverty gospel is, is stemmed from this place that we see in Luke chapter 4. So I normally won't jump straight into the Bible as an introduction, but I want to see, I want you to hear this. As Jesus begins his ministry in Luke, he stands up and gives this short sermon where he quotes this passage and says, I'm the one who fulfills this passage. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. Gospel means good news. To proclaim good news to the poor. And he's sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He says, I'm the one who fulfills all this. So this is really, really interesting. If you've, if you've never interacted with Jesus, if you've never read anything that he said, this is how he chooses to begin his ministry. This is the first sermon he starts to preach. And he says, he quotes from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scriptures and says, I have good news. And it's for poor people and blind people and people who've been arrested and abused. And so I like the good news part, but I don't necessarily know that I'm the one that it's for. So that's what we're exploring a little bit in, in this series. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what we'll be exploring in this series. And we're going to be taking a look at what happens next after they try to throw him off a cliff and he just kind of walks through them. So let's pause together and let's pray. <laughs> um, Jesus, there's no technical glitch. There's no um, blip that shows up on my radar that wasn't a surprise to you. And Lord, you've still brought us here together this morning. You've helped us to, to gather in your spirit. Lord, we, we've sang together true words about your infinite and unending love for us. So Lord, we ask that you would calm our hearts, that you'd quiet our minds, that as we come to your word, we'd come seeking to understand what it is that you have said. Father, if there's anything I might say this morning that's my opinion or is not true, Lord, I pray that it would be quickly forgotten, but that the, the, the truth of your word and the spirit of that you speak through it with, I pray that those things would endure in our hearts. I thank you for this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So if you'd like to follow along with me, there should be a blue Bible stuffed under the chair in front of you. And we're going to continue in Luke chapter 4 and verse 31. And that's on page 1073 in those blue Bibles. So um, 1073 in the blue Bibles. We're in Luke chapter 4 and verse... 31. Luke 4.31 And he, being Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. And he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? 
I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits. And they come out and reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. I'm going to pause there because you likewise might be asking, what then is this word? Um, there's a couple of things, a couple of features that are happening in this section of scripture. And I'm going to try to, to highlight a couple of them and help us come to a place where we understand a little bit of what's going on. So first things first, where is he? He, he ended in Nazareth, which was his hometown. And when they tried to throw him off a cliff, he left. And he went to a different city, uh, a little bit south called Capernaum. And Capernaum is this really fascinating uh, little city. It was my favorite site in the time that we spent in Israel, um, probably because it was the only time that we actually got a little bit of a break and got to rest there. And it's, it's seated right on the top of the, sea, of the Sea of Galilee. So you're looking down on this freshwater lake and there are these big rolling hills coming down on this side. And they're really, really pretty, but that's where the Gentiles live. So we don't actually go over there. And then on the other side is also really pretty, but not quite as impressive. And that's where all the Jews live because it's actually functional to get a boat off the shore there. And you've got this, the, the Jordan River coming down and flowing into the sea. And it's just very picturesque and very beautiful. And so he comes to this, this city that's called Capernaum. And it's actually going to end up being a little bit of a home base for him. He's going to set up camp. And then as Jesus goes along, he'll go out and do some preaching and he'll come back and hang out in Capernaum again. And he'll go out and do some preaching, but then he'll return to Capernaum. So it, this is kind of a, a, an epicenter for his ministry, a place where he would go and take rest. But this is the first time we have a record of him being there in the, in the way that Luke has, has written this um, and he was teaching the people on the Sabbath, which we talked about a little bit last week. If you weren't here last week, that's okay. Um, if you'd like to catch up and listen in, it's on our website or on our podcast or on our YouTube page. You can listen to the message from last week. But he's teaching them on the synagogue, in the synagogue, which is very similar to what we're doing this morning. The only difference is the synagogue was more like church in the round. Um, they would sit in a rectangle around the person who was speaking and they'd all get together, they would sing songs together, they would read scripture together, and then someone would get up and talk a little bit about the scripture. They'd give a, a sermon of, of sorts. And so that was how Jesus began his ministry, out in the country, do, going around to different synagogue gatherings, and preaching and teaching. And as he's preaching, this time, there's a man in the crowd, in the crowd, in, in the circle, who has the spirit of an unclean demon. So there's a couple of things about that that I find very interesting. First, let's talk about demons because we don't always talk about demons. What is a demon? Um, well, a demon is an angel that chose to rebel against God. See, um, there's, there's this idea that's popular today that the forces of good and evil are in this war and there's good forces for good and from good that are that are waging war against forces that are evil from evil for evil. But, but demons and, and all, of, all of the demons are actually corrupted angels. So all of creation is created good, but the sin that is in the world is, is, is a corruption. So when you think about angels and demons, we're not like, don't think about the dynamic of good versus evil, although that is a component. Think about good versus corrupted good. And the corrupted good wants to spread corruption. Does that make a little bit of sense? So we've got these angelic beings that were made good that said, you know what, that one angel, I like him a lot. His name's Lucifer, and he thinks he can be a better God than God can. Story as old as time. And so God's going to kick them out, and, and now they are opposed to God's work in the world. So they're spiritual entities. They don't necessarily have a body, but they're, they want to spread the corruption um, of sin through the world, all right? So there's a person in the synagogue who is possessed or under the influence of this evil spirit. Does that make anybody else uncomfortable? <laughs> like, I don't, I go to church to go be around good people. I don't go to church to be around, like, wicked people who are possessed by demons. 
right? Like if I'm, if I'm in a church building, if I'm in a worship gathering, if I'm singing next to somebody who I don't know really well, my hope is that there's somebody who's going to be a positive influence for my life, not a negative influence for my life, right? So just be aware. Jesus is in a synagogue. He's in a group of religious people, and one of them is possessed by a demon. All right? So I'm not telling you to look sideways at your neighbor. I'm just saying be aware that the conflict doesn't stop when we go into a gathering that we think is good. The conflict happens even this morning. Here's how I know it. Because when I start to talk about the spiritual conflict, when I start to talk about um, how there's these demonic forces, I know that immediately the things that start happening in this room are distractions. Immediately, we want to be focused on how the projector isn't working or how the slide doesn't look right or he doesn't have images this morning or like, man, I really am I'm hungry. I'm not normally hungry at this time, but I'd really like to stop early and go get lunch, right? Like as soon as we start talking about these things, there's suddenly distractions. So I just want you to be aware that the conflict doesn't stop when we get into a safe place. And this demon stands up in the middle of the sermon and says, what do you have to do with us? Jesus of Nazareth, you're not from around here. You're from up north. What do you Yankee, what's you Yankee got anything to do to say about us around here? Huh? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. That doesn't really seem like a slam, does it? I know who you are. I know what you're up to. You're the Holy One of God. You're the Anointed One of God. You're the Messiah that God sent to save us all. That doesn't sound like a slam. Like if, if, you got, if I was preaching and you got up and like, hey, you're like a, a really good pastor and people are going to come to follow Jesus. It'd be like, okay, thanks. Like what, what, what's happening here? Why, is, why, why does it matter that this demon is pointing out something that seems to be a good thing? For the Jewish mindset, when they thought about the Holy One, the Holy One is another word for the Anointed One, it's another word for Messiah, um, and the Greek is, of that is Christ. So Jesus, Christ, Christ is not his last name, it's a title. <laughs> so, so his name is Jesus of Nazareth, but he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he's the sent one from God. As Jews would read their Old Testament, as they'd read the Hebrew Scriptures, not knowing what God was getting ready to do very well, they understood that when the Messiah comes, he doesn't just come as a nice guy who walks around with lambs and tells everybody that their sins can be forgiven. Their understanding of the Messiah was somebody who walked in with a sword, kicked the door down, and took over everything. He was the king coming to reign in power and authority. Jesus is like, yeah, I am that guy, but not right now. And so if, you, if, if I walk into a group of people and they suddenly think that I'm going to be like this, this great general and I'm going to lead an army to go overthrow the government, then their expectations of me are very different if I just want to point them to, hey, your hearts are corrupt before, before God and you need to fix that. Or rather, I will fix that if you will trust me. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So it's not, it's not time yet for him to be declared as the Holy One of God. Um, and yet the demon's trying to get things off track here, right? If, 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 I can get, if I can get people to think the wrong thing about Jesus, then they won't hear anything he's actually trying to say. And so Jesus says, hey, shut up. Come out of it. And he does. He, the, when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. So this is like legit exorcism stuff. Um, and typically we reserve that for the Catholics. We let them do some of this stuff. But, but Jesus is here, is here doing it, right? And he doesn't have a bunch of rituals around it. He just says, hey, you're done. Get out. And he does. So if we tend to think about... A, a, a cosmic battle between good and evil. I just want you to see that the, the, the scales are weighted strongly for the good. Jesus just says, leave, and he does. The demon, the demon could, I guess, put up an argument, but he don't. He knows better. He knows who he is, right? And so he gets out and leaves. So, 
And everybody, everybody's amazed, everybody's astonished by the word. Not only does he have authority to speak the word, not only does he have the authority to preach, but he also has like real power in the real world. Like, and I don't know, <laughs> like, I don't know if they kind of suspected this guy had a demon or if it was news to them that morning. I could read a lot in between the lines there about some churches I grew up in, <laughs> but I'm not going to. You know what I mean? Whatever, whatever the situation was beforehand, it was resolved. And people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. I, I don't know, like here's, here's the thing I don't know, and I wonder. I wish that I had more detail. Was anybody surprised when he stood up and started heckling him? Or was, or was this guy like, oh, well, here goes Jeff. All right, we'll give, we'll give him a minute. He'll be, he'll be done here shortly. I don't, I don't know, and I wish I had more information. But whatever happened, they were astonished that Jesus had resolved it. So here's, here's, a, here's an application question before we give you the big idea. Do we allow opposition to make us insecure about following Jesus? Because Jesus is doing his thing, and he has this distraction pop up literally in the middle of what he's doing. And I have the inkling, like in my heart, that if that kind of thing happens, I'm like, oh, does God not want me to do this? Like, I'm not sure if I'm following Jesus the right way, like, because that person said mean things about me, and I don't know if I really should. So does opposition make us insecure about following Jesus? Because Jesus came with a mission, and he knew precisely what he was going to do, and opposition didn't faze him. Shut up and get out. So does opposition make us insecure? Because here's, here's our big idea for the morning. Jesus' good news will not be derailed by evil spiritual entities. Jesus' good news will not be derailed by evil spiritual entities. And I've, I've, I've used those words very particularly, especially in this Star Wars age. I ain't talking about a force. <clears throat> It is, we're not talking about spiritual like goodness kind of flowing through the world and spiritual evil kind of like trying to take over and Palpatine and blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. These are evil spiritual entities. There are personalities behind these demonic forces. I just, I want to be clear about that. But even their opposition it doesn't stand a chance against Jesus' good news. He says, look, I came to proclaim good news. It's coming. If you have something opposite to say, shut up and get out. Jesus' good news will not be derailed by evil spiritual entities. And not even be derailed by like somebody who's saying what is true at the wrong time. Let's continue reading in verse 38. Luke chapter 4, verse 38. So he being Jesus, <clears throat> and he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on, on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. I'm going to pause there. There's a couple of things happening here. So this is kind of why I think Jesus sets up his hometown or sets up his home base in, in Capernaum is because this is where Peter grew up. And Peter was one of the disciples, but he hasn't called Peter yet. It's, that's the next chapter we'll talk about next week. <clears throat> and so he walks into Peter or Simon's house, the same guy, and, and Simon's mother-in-law is sick. Small detail kind of blew my mind because I hadn't thought much about it. It's his mother-in-law. Peter was married. This is the only information we have about Peter's marriage, but there it is. Peter was married. I never have considered that. He goes into his mother-in-law's house, and, and she's sick. She's got a fever. And I think this is a great, like this little section of passage, this paragraph of Scripture is profound. 
Um, so much so that I actually have already preached on it. Uh, if you look back in our archives for our Mother's Day sermon, I, I went in on this, and there's lots of things here, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But except to say that Jesus walks in and heals this woman, and she gets up and starts to serve. And she gets up to start to serve. And look at verse 40. Now, when the sun was setting, I'm going to ask an obvious question. What time of day is it? Is, is after dinner time. Anybody else like me, after dinner time, I'm done. I'm ready for bed, all right? <clears throat> so now, at, when the sun was setting, all those who had any sick with various diseases brought them to him. Okay, all right, look, look, look. I, I worked in a subway shop um, uh, growing up in, in, in high school. And there's this weird time of day in like the 45 minutes before you close because you like, want to get stuff done to get stuff cleaned up so you can go home, but you're not closed yet. And so you've got, you've got like, you, maybe you just sanitized all the countertops and then somebody walks in the door. Like, Why are you somebody to do sanitize all this? I'm going to do it all again. And it's frustrating, right? Like you kind of just want to go flip the sign or turn the sign off. You don't lock the door, but the lights aren't really on anymore. Like there's this weird thing. And that's, that is what has happened. Jesus, it's the end of the day. And, and there, here's why. It's the end of the day, and it's the Sabbath. So people can't actually walk. Like, there's a religious thing where they're not allowed to walk so far. But as soon as the sun goes down, they can see a couple stars in the sky. They're like, all right, we got to get to this guy. We've heard what's happening. we got to go right now because I'm sick. I need healing. And so Jesus is, like, flipping the clothes sign, and there's just a herd of people coming over the hill. And he's like, <clears throat> no, he's not. Well, he might have been. I don't know. <clears throat> it doesn't say what he said. It doesn't say how he reacted. It says what he did. He laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Jesus, at the end of the day, after preaching, after kicking demons out of people, the Sabbath, trying to take some rest, and people show up, and he has compassion on them. And again, he's casting out demons, and as the demons come out, hear what they're screaming. Hear what the demons are screaming. You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. It's not time for people to know yet. They won't understand. They won't understand. Keep your mouth shut. It's not time yet because my good news will not be derailed by evil spiritual entities. It's not time yet. Let's look at one more passage. <clears throat> Luke 4, 42. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving. them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So it's the next day. I suspect he had a late night healing people. And he's like, I'm, I'm, it's time for me to go. And so he goes out. He doesn't take the road. He goes out in desolate places. He's like, I got to leave, but I can't go on the highway. I'm going to go a different direction. And people chase him down. Like, no, 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 you can't leave. We're not done with you yet. Like, we really, we want to hear more of what you have to say. Like, you have, you, you're speaking truth and you're, you're healing and you're kicking all these demons out and we haven't felt so cleansed in a really long time. Like, Jesus, you can't go yet. We need you here. We need you here. We need you here. And he says, I need to leave now. The good news is not just for you. I must go to the other towns as well. This is what I came to do. And honestly, this is fascinating. This is the first mention of the kingdom of God in Luke's biography of Jesus. It's the first time that that phrase shows up. And here's the thing. I don't know what these people are seeking. I have a suspicion, but I don't know. Are they seeking the good news? Or are they seeking the symptoms of the kingdom? <clears throat> if, if we have a disease or if we have an illness, if we have a cold, 
there are symptoms of it, right? We have a runny nose, we have a fever, we have something like that. But the runny nose and the fever are actually a reaction to the infection. It's not, the, the runny nose and the fever are not the problem. They're symptoms of the problem, right? So Jesus healing people and casting out demons, I think, are not the thing that he came to do, but they are symptoms of the kingdom. And so I don't know if people are seeking the kingdom. I don't know if they're seeking the good news that Jesus came to proclaim or they're seeking the symptoms of the kingdom. You are doing these things and we want more of them. I don't care what the heart is that you're driving at. I don't know. And he says, look, I came, I came to share the good news of God in other places. And that's what I'm going to do. By all means, perhaps, we might look at this and go, man, Jesus was really successful. He was a preacher that people didn't want to stop preaching. And I don't know that I've ever met one of those. People were asking for more. They were begging, please don't go. Like, we, we want to hear more from you. Don't go. He was successful. And perhaps the most dangerous thing for us in our lives and our spiritual walk is what we perceive as success. And people are saying nice things about you because that feels good. And I'm not saying that people have to say bad things about you in order for you to be on the right path. I'm just saying that when people happen to say nice things about you, don't take it personally. Do we allow success to distract us from following Jesus? Because we could look at that and say, oh man, the crowds are coming. People are, we must be doing something right because people want more of it. And Jesus said, I'm doing what's right by walking away from a crowd of people who really want me to share more. I'm doing the right thing by leaving sick people behind and going to another place. I'm doing the right thing by pressing on when people would rather me to stay. So do we allow success to distract us from following Jesus? I feel like now that it's up there, I should explain. As we were talking about, um, as we were talking about the crowd coming in at closing time, and Jesus was probably getting ready for bed. Like we've got a routine, a physical routine, and those are good and healthy things. But sometimes our routine can distract us from meeting the need or following Jesus if opportunities arise. Because the bottom line is, Jesus' good news will not be derailed by evil spiritual entities, no matter what kind of opposition, what kind of attack, what kind of distraction, good things can distract from the best thing that they may send our way. Jesus' good news will not be derailed. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your power and your authority. Lord, we thank you that in a, in a battle that can be really scary to think about between angels and demons, you not only have the upper hand, you're the only one with any authority in the fight. So God, as we read about demons and, and, and interactions in the past, Lord, we're not filled with fear, but comforted that you have authority over them. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to draw us close to you, that you'd continue to, to lead us forward into the truth of your word. That maybe we've come to you seeking the symptoms of the kingdom, but, Lord, we pray that you'd lead us to seek the kingdom itself and the king of the kingdom, which makes it so great. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.